the uh, International Workers Conference kind of took over. I guess so. That's all right. We are uh, in the book of Romans, and if you have a, haven't picked up a Bible or you don't have a Bible, there's always Bibles available in the back. We really, uh, I'd love for you to see when we talk about the scriptures, uh, and we're, we're blessed that Romans is so deep. And uh, today's uh, sermon title and outline and Deeper Life Crisis is in the middle of the bulletin. Uh, we would love it if you would pick up the bulletin, and I noticed that some of you, when you picked up the bulletin, Probably one of those thank you for your service cards fell out of it. We're not really, uh, you know, putting things in bulletins, but I thought that would be good for everyone to have. If you look over it, if you're not going to use it, just return it to the uh, Welcome Center. If you want more, uh, obviously those thank you for your service are at the Welcome Center, and they, I, they're always there. But we entitled this in Chapter 6 of Romans, uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to the uh, Roman church, and he uses this expression that we are dead in our sins. We are walking around as people without Jesus, dead in our sins. I, I thought about that, uh, and I thought maybe it would be a good title to call it The Walking Dead, but I think that title has already been taken by some TV series. But in reality, without the Holy Spirit, changing us inside out, the people around us who do not know Jesus as their Savior are the walking dead. Now let that sink in for a moment. They are dead in their sins. And of course, when I hear that, I uh, obviously have spoken on this before, I am reminded of the many zombie movies and TV shows that are coming at us almost all the time. And I think the real reason why we're so fascinated about zombie me, me, uh, movies is because we don't want to die. We want to somehow continue to live in this life as long as possible, as long as we can. And I was thinking about that, and I was looking up some zombie movies, and I was thinking about uh, 2012 when a movie came out. It was a zombie movie. And uh, don't confuse the zombie movie I'm going to talk to you about with Steven Spielberg's 2012 movie about Abraham Lincoln, which had 12 nominations, Academy nominations. Because this movie is a little bit different. It was called Abraham Lincoln versus Zombies. And that came out in 2012 also. Uh, maybe some of you saw it. As a matter of fact, there's been several sequels of Abraham Lincoln and, and other movies. So I don't know if you want to check that out. Zombies have been the topic of, listen to this, over 570 major films. Are we into this or what? Uh, zombies have, uh, are those reanimated corpses or mindless human beings which are cannibalistic. Uh, they are distinct from ghosts or mummies, or vampires or other types of undead. Uh, and the first, believe it or not, the first Zombie movie was White Zombie. It was released in uh, 1932, Victor Hepburn's uh, zombie movie. And honestly, they've been cranking them out ever since. Now, why do I talk about this? Why all the fuss about the living dead? I think people uh, in general uh, don't want to die. They want to continue to live. And whether they want to live dead in their sins or live in the victory of Jesus, they don't want to die. I always go back to Woody Allen's uh, quote. He says, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. That's really profound. Uh, he also said in another context, it's not that I'm afraid to die, I just want, want to be there when it happens. When I talk about fear of death, I think all of us can relate to that. Either we know someone who's absolutely fearful of death, or we ourselves are afraid to die. The reason why I bring this up, because in Christ... The Bible says several times, I was trying to look it up, I, I know at least 10 references where those of us who are in Christ should not fear death. 
Why? Because Jesus conquered sin and death for us. And death is a doorway to heaven. As a matter of fact, it's very clear in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14. Listen to this verse. He's talking to the children uh, uh, who are uh, of, uh, of Christ. Uh, he's, he did start by talking about the children of Israel. But he, but he also talks about those of us who have faith in Jesus. He says, since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by what? Their fear of death. Now, someone pointed out to me and says, wow, the devil ha- holds the power of death? Well, like, the devil makes us fearful of death, and we don't want to go there, so we decide not to obey God to avoid death. Some of you have chosen occupations that keep you away from death. And there's some brave men and women in here who chose occupations that they're in the face of death most of the time. Sometimes God is calling us maybe to be missionaries, but we don't want to go there. We like our life in America much better than putting our life on the line in some places like Niger where they kill Christians. And we'd rather stay here in our comfort zone. And that is the power that Satan has on us because we'd rather listen to him sometimes than be obedient to God. But Jesus has come to free us from the fear of death so that we can extend ourselves in places that we would normally not go because we're Christ's children and we do not fear death. As I was uh, just bringing up this passage, I'd like us to go to our passage this morning. And our passage is again in in, uh, Romans 6. I'd like to read verses 1 to 7. It'll be on the slide. It's a lot of verses, but... Listen to what Apostle Paul is saying here, and, uh, and we'll pick it up uh, in that text. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sitting that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in the resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. He's going off of chapter 5. Remember, we're redeemed in Jesus Christ. And so the the immorality that we lived in or the sin that bothers us or the lust of the flesh that, that many people around us continue to live in If we are in Christ Jesus, we have died to that way of life. That's what the Bible says. And now we've been resurrected in a new way of life, a moral way of life, an obedient way of life with the power of the Holy Spirit. So as you uh, look at the outline, I want to first talk about water baptism because it's been really a blessing of mine to see uh, how some of you have come forward to be baptized. And, uh, and as we look at water baptism, uh, think about this for a moment. And we have a pool up here, and we'll baptize anybody anytime. Uh, you just, uh, we'll fill up the water. Water baptism is a very interesting thing. Of all the things that Jesus could have used to identify us with him, to have that identity gift that he wants to give us, he said we are to take people and in public dunk them in water. 
Now, when I was at the pools and I was a lifeguard for a couple seasons, and when kids were dunking each other and four or five kids would team on, on one person and dunk them in the water, I had to break it up. Churches applaud it when I dunk someone in the water. Think about that. They, after I dunk someone in the water and I pull them out, everybody goes, yeah, oh, that was great. Hey, man, I used to punish kids for doing that. Why? There's a symbolism there. There is a symbolism. When I'm taking somebody down in the water, they appear to be lowered into their coffin. Sometimes they, they fold their hands like this, or sometimes they put their hand over here. And it almost as if they're going down into the water as we lay them in the coffin. As a matter of fact, if I hold them in the water 20 minutes, they would be in their coffin, right? In their watery grave. But I bring them up out of the water and they breathe that breath because they've been under the water of new life in Jesus. It's a, it's a perfect picture of what happens in our lives when we accept Jesus as our Savior. Baptism is being buried in death. It symbolizes our resurrection from the grave. And when I look at this passage, we got to understand that Paul is not really talking about Water baptism, although he is hinting at it, okay? And he's saying, this is why we get baptized. But he's trying to say that when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, you were crucified with Christ, and then you were resurrected with Christ in new life. You see what I'm getting at? And Paul is getting that point. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that he's talking about. And if we've been baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit, if we've been brought into the family of God and we truly know Jesus as our Savior, there will be this new energy, this new life to do what God wants us to do and not to live in the sins of the old life. It's a transformation. The next three chapters, chapters 6, 7, and 8, have to do with this. First, in chapter 6, we're called to be dead in our sin. Chapter 7, dead to the law. Chapter 8, alive to the Spirit. Chapter 6 emphasizes that sin no longer reigns in us. Chapter 7 says that the law no longer reigns over us. We don't have to have a list to tell us what is good and what is bad. We need to know the Holy Spirit as it directs us to be obedient to God. You know, because those lists are good, I'm a, I tell the men at the men's discipleship, I'm a legalist. I love lists. Then I can check them off and I can feel good about myself. I check all the things off. I say, man, I'm doing pretty good. No. We need the Holy Spirit because there are things that are not on the list that God is calling us to do. And it's by the Holy Spirit that we're motivated to do those things, like to talk to our neighbor about Jesus or to bring a plate of food to the person who uh, is home alone or to call our brothers and sisters, when they don't call us. See, those kind of things are not on the list. If I made my list, they would not be on there. But when God has called me to be different than the world, to be transformed and live a, a moral life and not an immoral life, I've got other things to do that are not on the list. And chapter 8 is where the Holy Spirit is mentioned and should reign over us. The three topics of sin and, and law and spirit are going to be covered in the next uh, few chapters. We are to reign in life. But, as I said, I have a problem. I am one of those living dead. I am one of those walking dead. It's only Jesus that gives me the power to put down the old man and live in the new man. You know, again, I, I, I want to talk about this because, because sometimes we feel stuck in the body of sin that we were born into. And we try to please God out of that body of sin. In chapter 6, we're going to talk about how the old nature has been crucified with Christ. But the good that I do is still tainted when I'm doing it out of the old nature. When I'm doing it out of Mike Gerhardt's strength and trying to please God by thinking, you know, what does God really want me to do? You know, I got, I got to obey the Ten Commandments. I got that down. But coveting is pretty hard to do. You know, keep 
but uh, he doesn't mind that I covet a little bit here and there, right? So I'm checking off my list, and I'm doing the Mike Gerhardt thing. I'm still living in the body of sin. When I'm living in the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, things look different. My life is different. The good that I do in my old nature is tainted, but the good that I do in the power of the Holy Spirit brings him glory. Sin is not simply an outward action. It involves inward attitudes and inward dispositions. you got to change the way you think, and that's my hope today. That as we look at this, and by the way, this was just the introduction, the victory of the flesh is to know, to calculate, and to yield. And that's the outline, right? To know, to calculate, and to yield. Okay? Stay with me. So we must know. We must know some things. Paul uses the word know in this section four times. Satan wants to keep us in the dark when it comes to spiritual truths. He wants us to think that our life is perfectly good. We don't need to talk to people about Jesus. We don't even need to live in a spiritual life. We don't need to call our brother or our sister on the phone to tell them about Jesus. We just need to be relaxed and enjoy this life. And that is true. We should relax and we should enjoy this life. But we are living on purpose for the glory of God because we're in Christ Jesus. So we must know some things that Satan wants to keep us from. First of all, living a life of sin should be impossible because the true Christian is dead to sin. I want you to write this down. It's not in your outline, but write this down. Get a pen out, pencil, whatever you want. Once we were dead in sin, now we are to be dead to sin. Once we were dead in sin, we were the walking dead, we were zombies, but now we are to be dead to sin. Think about that. That's a big transformation. This is the wonderful truth of our identification in Christ to be having this identity gift from God. And it comes by knowing the power of Jesus' cross. When we worship, and I, I hope you do worship churches where they do show the cross, we are to be reminded over and over and over, even in communion, that Jesus paid it all. He died on that cross for our sins to give us brand new life. And that is a very important. When we understand the power of that thought, that his death removed all of our sins so that when God looks at us, he looks at Jesus' righteousness. And to live in that thought and live in that disposition that we are children of God, that when you walk out of here, you're a child of the king. And to live that way. Jesus... Uh, not only died for us, but we died with him. When the Spirit baptized into the body of Christ, we were buried with him and raised to new life. The three, verses three and four do not refer, as I said, to water baptism, but the operation of the Holy Spirit in putting us in the body of Christ as members, illustrated by water baptism. When Christ died and we trusted in his death to save us, we died with him. That's what Paul says. When Christ was raised from the dead by the power of God, and when we are raised in our new life by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are, we are tracking exactly what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. And he's doing it in your life and mine. And it's not just a one-time thing. It's, it's, a, it's a mindset. It's, a, it's I am new in Christ. I know the power of the cross. Because the power of the cross broke the power of sin. And we are free, and I want to make this emphasis, we are free from the enslaving power of sin. Now, people will come up to me and say, well, Pastor Mike, does that mean we don't sin anymore? No, no, it doesn't mean we don't sin. It's we are free from the enslaving power of sin. There are many people you know that say, oh, I just can't stop doing it. No, I've been doing this all my life. I can't stop. I've been a liar all my life. I've been this. I've been that. You know, I just can't stop doing it. That's, what I, that's who I am. 
I've been having these sexual urges all of my life, so I, I just can't stop doing it. I'm this way. And they even add to this, I, I think God made me this way. Yes, God made you to sin against his word. Does that make any sense to you? But that's what we're being told by many people around us, aren't we? In the immorality that we see in this world, we are being told that God made me this way. Matter of fact, they're not even saying that anymore. That was, that's got to be at least three years old now. Now they're saying, I chose this way. This is my identity. This is what I want to be. Okay, well, that means that you are choosing a way of sin. You're choosing a way of immorality. And honestly, we need to love and care for our neighbors and our friends and family members that have chosen those lifestyles and love them and pray for them because they are walking dead. And if they continue to walk in that lifestyle of immorality, they will not be in heaven with us. And that's a powerful statement, by the way. It's repeated in Scripture. So we need to grab a hold of how we can be free from the enslaving power of sin. Does that mean I never sin? No, I will sin. And by the way, ask my wife. I always say this. Just ask my wife, what did Mike do this week? <laughs> what did Mike do today? Whatever, you know. And she'll have, yes, I fail. But I'm free from the enslaving power of sin. And this, by the way, as we're, we read in chapter 6, verses 1 to 10, is the will of the Father. The old nature can no longer reign as king over the Christian who knows the truth. Amen? I hope you're with me. Think about it. So now I want to look at the next part of the scriptures, okay? This is uh, verses uh, 8 through 14. Listen to what Paul says. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves. And by the way, this word count is like calculate. Calculate for yourselves. Get your calculator out. Figure it out. Calculate. Count yourselves dead to sin and alive but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been bought from death, brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under the law, you're under what? You're under grace. It's not about obedience to law. There's so many Pharisees and Sadducees and, and uh, Herodians that thought they were checking off the list of the law and said, I got this. It's not about obeying the law. It's about living in the grace and the power of God. So the next thing on your outline is must calculate. So what do we have to calculate? Well, first of all, he says, Count yourselves dead to sin. By the way, this is hard to believe. We're in chapter 6, and this is the first command of Paul to the Romans. The first command. This is the first time he writes a command to the Romans. Count yourselves dead to sin. God does not tell us to crucify ourselves, but to believe that the old nature has been crucified, because, you know, think about this, just for one thought. Crucifixion is one death that you cannot inflict on yourself, right? In order to be crucified, you need some help, right? Think about that for a moment. God doesn't say, all right, you go and crucify yourself. He says, you are crucified with Christ. You're crucified because Jesus died on that cross. You're crucified with him. It's a picture of ourselves. It's an identification with Jesus that we really need to have in our mind. I have been crucified with Christ. And then he says also, you are 
raised to newness in life. Count yourself also alive in Christ. The reckoning is simply that step of faith that applies what God has said about me in the Bible and make it true into my life. Reckon. Reckon is a, is a faith action. Resting on the word of God despite the circumstances or the feelings that I have. Because the feelings can be very deceptive. I, I, I think I've said this before again. You know, we are still carrying around the dead corpse of Mike Gerhard in my life. And I'm also carrying around the new life in Jesus. And they fight each other, by the way. You know, some, and I've said this before. Sometimes I feel like an identical twin. And you guys, you're, you're smiling because you've seen the, the, the angel on the one shoulder and the devil on the other. Uh, don't you feel that sometimes? Mike, you really should lie at this time. Mike, don't tell the truth. It's so much better if you lie. And then the other one said, well, you know, you're supposed to tell the truth. And the other Mike fights with the other. I feel like I'm an identical twin. They're both Mike. I can't, by the way, people will say, well, the devil made me do it. No, no, I know. I know the devil didn't make you do it. Maybe the devil tempted you, but guess who did it? You did it. You did it, because you were dead in sin, but now been made alive in Christ. So the, the last point is that we must yield. We must yield to this idea. If believers truly reckon themselves dead to sin, then they would be proving their faith by yielding themselves to the power of God that is theirs. This is step three in the process of getting victory. Keep in mind that these steps to know, to, to calculate, and to yield should be done on a daily basis. Wake up and think of who you are in Christ. Your identity gift is you're in Christ. Don't let Satan do identity theft and say you're not a Christian or you're not acting like a Christian. and You'll never act like a Christian. That's what Satan wants to do. And that's why he has the power of death over you because he continues to fill you with lies. And we need to be filled with the truth. Believers who spend time in the word will have faith to calculate their situation and be reckoned dead to sin and yield to the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Sin is not the problem. Jesus took care of the problem. The problem is our attitude toward our sin. It's always been that way. Change your attitude. Victory comes when we understand that we've been crucified with Christ and we are now living in the power of the Holy Spirit. I told you about a guy named Jeff Kinley, I think a couple weeks ago, who wrote a book, and we had him here for a weekend a couple years ago. Uh, Jeff Kinley writes a lot of good books. I recommend him. He was a friend of mine. Jeff and I had a lot of, in common when we were in seminary. Uh, he played the guitar, I played the guitar. He wrote songs, I wrote songs. He was in a rock band, I was in a rock band. We got together and jammed a couple of times together and uh, it was not, not on seminary campus. No, no, it was not on seminary. And then he failed his uh, first semester Hebrew and I, I decided, since he was a good friend of mine, I'd fail too. Uh, he wrote the book called The Christian Zombie Killer's Handbook. The Christian Zombie Killer's Handbook, Slaying the Living Dead Within. This is, comes right out of Romans chapter 6. It also has a really great, uh, gory, bloody, uh, zombie, I was trying to get one, it really has a lot of, it's got a zombie novel in it, you know, zombies killing people and things like that, it's really, uh, Great novel that's in it. And then after a chapter of reading the novel, he then illustrates from Romans 6 the truth of the zombie that lives inside and how we need to kill the zombie inside, how we need to be dead to sin and alive to Christ. The idea is that we have an inner zombie which is genetically encoded to our DNA. It's been there since Adam ate the fruit. And the zombie pulls us away. Uh, I put the title up there for you if you want to pick up the book. 
The zombie is our dark, identical twin that rides with us everywhere we go and is always urging us to step away from the light and step away from the will of God and do something of your own light. Be yourself. Don't listen to other people. Do what you want to do. No one else is looking out for you. You got to be number one. That's not biblical. None of that is biblical. You know what Jesus said? He said, you need to die to yourself. He might have well said, you need to die to the zombie that's living inside of you and live for me. That's biblical. And we as Americans, and I include myself in that, we have a hard time dying to ourselves. Because in our country, we're told that it's all about me. And it's not. It's all about Jesus and his glory. Respond to sin as a dead person. <laughs> I once heard this. Whenever you feel like sitting, say, I can't do that now. I'm dead. Yeah. Somebody says to you, hey, let's go to the bar and get drunk. I'm sorry, I can't do that now. I'm dead. You'll get a response. Hey, let's go to this movie that has a lot of pornography. I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'm dead. If you start thinking that way and you ask for the power of God, you'll start living that way. Dead to sin. Alive to Christ. Here's one. Rejoice in the victory that God has given you. Constantly remind yourself of the victory that God has given you and rehearse the power of his sin in the Holy Spirit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here by saying that next time, next time the girls ask you out for tea and there's going to be lots of goss, gossiping going on, just apologize, excuse yourself from the table and say, you know, I'm sorry, I'm dead to gossiping. When you're out with the boys watching the big game and and the conversation turns bad, just say, I'm sorry, i got to excuse myself. I'm, I'm dead to this conversation. You are to be dead to sin. You must calculate who you are, and you must live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's stand as we close in a word of prayer. Father God, I am I'm talking to myself. There are some sins in my life that still present themselves. And the temptations are still there. Oh yeah, I can tell people I've given up alcohol. I can tell people I, I quit cigarette smoking. I can tell people I even quit cursing and, and taking the Lord's name in vain. But you know, Father, you know the zombie, Mike Gerhardt, who's in my life constantly pulling me to the dark side. And I know right here in this audience, there's someone that is fighting some urge, some desire to do something that is, that is against your will. Or, or someone who is living a life and doesn't even consider your will. Is being led by their own passions, is being led by their uh, selfish ambitions, who is being led by their they're zombie. And I pray, Father God, that we would all come to the conclusion that without Jesus Christ, we are dead in our sin. And with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we can have a new life and power over sin. I pray, Father, if anyone is making decisions this morning, they would let someone know that they would first of all pray to you and let you know they need you every hour. We pray this in the precious name of our Lord and